Let's give ZeneFX a big round of applause. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I guess we're gonna get started two minutes early, which is great because I packed in a lot of content into this period, so. Um, my talk is dissecting the Teddy Ruxpin reverse engineering the smart bear. It's essentially my experience uh, taking my child's toy and trying to see if it was gonna cause uh, any security nightmares for me. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll get into some fun things here on this presentation, so. Uh, a little bit about me. First of all, um, my Twitter handle is at XenFX. I go by XenFX. I'm a security researcher at Silence. Um, I'm a founding member of a hardware hacking group called The Exploiteers. Uh, and uh, I'm a contributing member to uh, a local community that we have called Austin Hackers. Um, a little bit about Exploiteers. Um, we have roughly 10 members, give or take a few, that uh, don't officially associate with us, but they are pretty much part of the group. Um, we have Agent HH, CJ, Cody, Gynophage, Maximus, MBM, Sarek, TD Wang, and uh, XO String or Null String, uh, and of course me. So our general goal is to just hack things, anything, anywhere. We originally started hacking Google TVs and then Google killed off the Google TV, so then we just started hacking anything we could get our hands on. Um, we have a pretty decent community and we're all very helpful, so uh, check out our Exploiteers site where we have like 60 plus uh, embedded devices that have roots and other hacks. Um, we also have an IRC network that I'll talk about at the end. So a little disclaimer, first of all, um, the data within this presentation was all stuff that I reverse engineered. I didn't have official documentation or anything else. Um, so a lot of my attempts were just essentially trial and error and reversing what I could, when I could. Um, I, I literally have been working on this for a very long time. Um, and uh, I, I, you'll see why it's essentially an RTOS environment, um, which can be a little more difficult because after root you want to interface with the peripherals. So terminology, um, you Teddyophiles will uh, uh, <laughs> will uh, will not or will already know this, but an Iliop is a brown bear-like creature with a kind disposition. You might think Teddy Ruxpin's a, a bear, but he's actually an Iliop. Um, so the OG Iliop. This was the 1980s uh, Teddy Ruxpin. I think we're, a lot of us are probably familiar with. Um, it used cassette tapes on. Uh, on its back that you replaced and you had physical books that read along with the cassette tapes. His mouth moved and his eyes opened and closed, but it was a physical movement, not an LCD screen like the newest revision. So the new Iliop, um, the new Iliop is this guy. Essentially, oops, uh, essentially he has animated eyes, a moving mouth, speaker, uh, Bluetooth low energy, uh, USB mass storage that is uh, used via uh, an internal micro SD card and a companion mobile app. Getting inside Teddy, so I'm about to show y'all what, <laughs> what, what this looks like. It's, it's terrifying. Um, so, uh, a little, <laughs> so a little about Teddy. Uh, this particular revision comes with a uh, mask that you put on him so he doesn't scare your kids when he's off. Uh, it's, it's needed too, because he, it, like I said, it's crazy. Uh, but let's take his jacket off and uh, get him out of here. This is essentially Teddy Ruxpin. This is Teddy's skin. <laughs> so it's, it's pretty enjoyable. And here's Teddy on. Hi, my name is Teddy Ruxpin. Can you and I be friends? No. No. I actually tried to wear his skin. It doesn't fit on my face. Um, so inside of Teddy, we have a logic board, and this is the, the top of the logic board. It's actually stored right in his eye area here. Um, there's this, uh, proprietary, or this chip called the Sonics, uh, it's the Sonics MCU. I don't remember what the uh, physical, or the, uh, the actual name of it was, but uh, there's a speaker driver, the Bluetooth low energy, there's an SPI flash, and then there's this, uh, uh, SD card slot that actually ends up holding um, the storybooks that are uh, stored on Teddy Ruxpin. Um, this is the logic board's bottom. You can see there are two 128 by 128 LCDs that are used for each individual eye. Um, and then on that previous picture, we'll go two slides back, you can see that there's uh, on the I guess right side, there is a module that says Teddy Firmware 1.1 
That module is an MYN822BLE module, which is essentially just a module for the uh, Nordic NRF51822 chip. Um, so here is the diagram for interfacing with its SWD port and also all the different GPIO pins that are used uh, within Teddy. They only have um, roughly 11 GPIO pins in use of the uh, 22 or so that are available um, or 26 that are available uh, and then of course they have SWDIO and SW clock hooked up uh, which is the uh, debug uh, pinout for software debugging uh, Cortex M0 chips. So with that particular pinout we were able to dump uh, the firmware for Teddy um, and also the RAM. Um, you can dump it with open OCD but I had a Seger J link based on doing some badge development for the whole badge life project and uh, I just used that with uh, NRF JPROG to dump the firmware and RAM. Um, like I said you can use open OCD and if you ping me I can give you a config to make that work. Um, so this particular Teddy instead of having physical books he uses a mobile app and so you can see in the mobile app picture they have a little cartoon picture of Teddy and his best friend Grubby. Um, <laughs> so uh, the, the mobile app works essentially by using uh, BLE to communicate um, when each page is turned and when a next story should be read. So I took that and I threw it, I took the APK and I threw it into JADX GUI and uh, it was really nothing more than a wrapper for a bunch of Adobe Air content. Um, so within the, the uh, APK was a, S a Swift file. Um, and I took that Swift file and then I threw it into JPEXs. Um, essentially, this is a flash decompiler um, and all the BLE stuff was within this Swift. So uh, if you are poking at your own Teddy, um, <laughs> you can, uh, you're better off not even looking at the APK, just unzip it, grab the Swift and throw it into uh, um, JPEXs. So I went ahead and I listed all the BLE info, the uh, receive and transmit uh, UUID characteristics and uh, all the commands to jump between storybooks um, and uh, to choose individual storybooks. I didn't, I don't plan on reading you all that. You can look and uh, reference the slides. Uh, at the bottom of the presentation, I didn't mention this at the beginning, but at the bottom of the presentation is uh, uh, a web address for our website. If you go to that website here after the talk, I'll have slides and some of my research content, but uh, I've been having trouble updating it uh, and I, I really don't want to on the hotel Wi-Fi. So uh, just check it when you get home. So you take the firmware uh, that you dumped with SWD and you can throw it into IDA and uh, it shows up as a just binary data, but then if you uh, choose ARM v7 um, LE and enter in these settings, you can actually go and look at uh, the disassembly and try to reverse some of it yourself. But uh, realistically, most of my stuff was done through visual analysis of the storybook files and a ton of trial and error. So um, I, I got it in IDA a little too late for me to spend too much time in that, uh, in this particular section. So uh, the Teddy Ruxpin books. So um, I showed y'all Teddy's face and body. Um, on the back, there's a micro SD pin, uh, pin out or header. And you can essentially connect into that and it pops up a mass storage device and has all the books on it, which are an intro file, an idle file, and then the 10 story books that uh, they provide. The, I'm, I'm thinking the idea was that they would release books at a later point for purchase and you just copy them over to the bear because they don't provide functionality to transfer it over um, through BLE. So within the storybooks, um, the files that are the container format um, for the storybooks are these SNX ROM files. Um, since I don't have the documentation, they could be called something else, but um, the, the magic string at the top of each file is S and X ROM um, in wide character, uh, so each one is individually null terminated. Um, the target exclusive contains two extra stories, but it was always a little more expensive than I wanted to pay, and uh, I bought six of these. Uh, so <laughs> I, I have way too many teddies. Um, so the SNX ROM files, I'd mentioned that they start with a magic string at the top, but then there's also the header format. The header format starts with a record stop and a record end, um, and then the table itself ends with FFFF. The data after you use that to extract the files within, you end up with 
uh, the raw image data first and then the audio files. The audio files always start with AU and the raw image files are all the rest of them. If you take the image files and you throw them into GIMP, GIMP has a feature that you can import raw data and then you can kind of play with the settings to see what the data is, um, which is on the left, you see the picture there. Um, you can see that they're RGB 565 and then they're 128 by 128 um, sizing. Uh, and yeah. So then the audio files, this is where things get a little bit crazier and this is where I spend a ton of my time. Um, it's a proprietary file format used by Sonics um, and it actually uses, uh, it uses this thing called a mark table to store um, the triggers for the data that shows on the eyes and then also for um, uh, the mouth movement. Essentially, and I'll get on that in the next slide, but uh, we'll, we'll get there now. Uh, so the header structure for this format um, is essentially the AU string, two bytes, uh, an unknown constant value. Since I was using a lot of trial and error and I didn't have the documentation or anything for this format, um, it, uh, I, there was a bunch of values that didn't seem to impact my tests and I couldn't figure out what they were actually used for. So the unknown constant value is uh, the two bytes that seems on, like it's on every single file and never changes. Um, there's the, then the sample rate, which is two bytes, the channel, which is always one, um, but is also two bytes, another unknown value, another unknown value, and then some, uh, then uh, a zero or one to dictate if there is a mark table, a silence table, another unknown value, and then the mark table data, silence table data, and audio data. The actual data structure, when I say audio data, mark table data, and silence table data, um, is the mark table is defined by uh, two to four bytes to signify the position, two bytes that signify the value of the data at that position, and then um, that particular table ends with OXFFF. It also, if the uh, position value is over 8000 uh, hex, um, it takes that and uses the next two bytes, adds them together, and uses that as the position value. Um, the silence table, uh, it was OX0 in every single Teddy Ruxpin file that I checked, and so it may, uh, I, 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 I don't know too much about that particular table um, outside of just some what I've done for some internet sleuthing, which is, uh, uh, which I'll talk about soon. And then the audio data, which is 16-bit signed Little Indian. Uh, the mark table, so when, when you're looking at the mark table, how this thing actually works is uh, if, the mark table has the position, va uh, position value and then the actual value. If the value is a zero, the mouth is closed. If the value's, value is one, the mouth is half open. If the value is two, the mouth is full open. Now anything after that that you specify will, sit, will correlate to uh, image frames that are within the storybook. So um, if you want to make, let's say, a special logo pop up or his eyes blink or something, you would essentially uh, put, the value, put the value of uh, that image data and then you would set up multiples to essentially make it a moving image or whatever you're trying to do. Um, but everything that you do, let's say your image file is, um, you know, number one, well, you're still going to have to be offset by the mouth open, mouth closed, um, and full mouth open um, values. So whatever it is, you have to offset it by three. Um, so then let's look at the silence table. So I talked about it earlier, but I didn't actually mention what it's for. The only thing this is here for is compression. Um, they don't use it. I guess the stories weren't big enough or it wasn't needed, but um, it essentially just references silent data and marks the position in the table. Um, and the only reason I knew that is because of just random internet searches on the subject. Uh, unfortunately, Teddy doesn't use it. I just know that the files themselves have that field. Um, and in my tests, they completely broke any time I tried to enable it. So um, then we go to the audio data. Uh, it is 16-bit little Indian stored, uh, signed uh, data that's stored after the mark table and silence detection table. It only supports 16 kilohertz uh, sample rates, and then it supports bit rates from 16, 20, 24, 28, and 32 kilobits per second. 
So what I've done for people who want to hack their own Teddy Ruxpin is I created this Teddy Ruxpone. And <laughs> essentially, there's, there's no OD in this presentation. It's simply just reverse engineering stuff. So um, I threw together uh, some Python code that essentially takes an input file, it breaks it down into a folder structure that contains an I folder, uh, an audio folder, and it throws all the eyes and all the audio into those uh, folders. You modify what you want and then you use that folder as an input to recreate a new file. Um, so if you take your Teddy, connect them to USB, take one of the uh, files, decompress it or uh, extract all the portions, modify it, rebuild it, then you can put that on the Bear's mass storage drive or device and uh, uh, be able to see the new content that you created. This is an example of said content. Um, it's been the background for all the slides, but I felt like for DEF CON, it was uh, important to throw the DEF CON logo into the eyes. Um, so let me show you a little demo that I created, which is <laughs> generally all the fun. I hope you don't mind, I know there's like a no video photography uh, rule or used to be, but I got this 3D camera that is awesome and I really want to use it so everyone can just uh, deal with me breaking that rule. Okay, cool, so let's make sure that it's nice and zoomed in. Let's play this guy right there and let me get this mic. Hello, okay, cool. And that's the outcome of months of work. <laughs> so uh, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, let me give thanks to the exploiteers, uh, one of my ex-colleagues, Ryan Smith, uh, the DEF CON staff for helping me on every presentation I've ever done, um, my family, especially my kid and wife for tolerating me destroying all of my kids' toys, <laughs> and then filling the kitchen with tons of hardware hacking gear. By the way, if you're leaving, I got free stuff to give out, so you may not want to. Uh, <laughs> Hack all the things. Uh, we have an IRC uh, server where people just jump in and they tell us what they're hacking on and if they have any problems and we help them. So if you are hacking on something, you're new, you just want to chat with like minded people, jump on uh, free node, channel exploiteers. There shouldn't be a dot in that channel name, my bad. Um, so just exploiteers without the dot. Um, and yeah, uh, if you go to the last three, the back three doors, uh, I got some of my, uh, my exploiteers friends um, they're going to be handing out these SD breakouts that we created um, based on a previous talk, but you can grab one of those. We've got some stickers. Um, we have some SAOs for your badges. Um, they don't work, but you can just tape them on or something. Who cares? <laughs> and yeah, thank you everyone for coming out uh, and braving the heat to get here.